Thank you for joining us. In our world today, more than ever, there's so much information people are presented with and so much misinformation. The media can influence the public with true facts that can inspire and lead to intelligent solutions or do the opposite. With us today is an internationally respected leader in education, Dr. Abram Fischler, President Emeritus of Nova University, and with us also is Colonel Renan Gissing. Dr. Gissin served as the Israel Army spokesman and as senior advisor to Prime Minister Ariel Sharon and as a frequent spokesman for the Israel government. He is regarded as one of Israel's leading spokesmen on security and strategic issues and the peace process as well, of course. And they'll both offer their views on these subjects following these messages. I read Life Extension magazine to keep abreast of medical discoveries that can literally save my life. Life Extension's track record dating back to 1980 shows they are decades ahead of conventional medicine in identifying proven methods to prevent and treat the diseases of aging. Reading Life Extension magazine will empower you to take control over your health and longevity. And as a special favor to me, the Life Extension Foundation will give a free one-year subscription to anyone today. Just call the number on this screen to obtain your free Life Extension subscription. There's no cost, no obligation, just the opportunity to discover solid options to live longer and better. Call the number on the screen today to start receiving Life Extension magazine each month. Take charge of your health. Get your free subscription to Life Extension magazine now by calling toll-free 1-800-509-9117 or visit www.lef.org. With this now is Abram Fischler, President Emeritus of Nova Southeastern University, and Colonel Vanan Gissin, PhD actually. Pleasure and honor to have you on the show again. Always. Thank you, Abe. Yeah. Good Colonel. to be back, Richard. Well, here we are today, experiencing another beautiful year, and the question is, from your respective perspectives, you as a military man from Israel and a PhD, and you as an educator in the United States, how do you see the condition of mankind these days with a view to intelligent solutions from an academic and other point of view? We go to school. No, 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 no. I'm interested in, in getting your perspective on them. I'll tell you something from my own personal experience. When I was a student at Syracuse University, I used to support myself. Uh, you know, I got a scholarship, but it wasn't enough. So on Fridays and Saturdays, I used to sing American folk songs in the pubs around Syracuse. And one of my favorite songs at the time, not mine, but the students, was talking about the early 70s, was a song by a, a you know, f now a very famous poet, but at the time, one that just burst out, you know, his name was uh, Bob Zimmerman, later known as Bob Dylan. And the song was, the times they are a-changing. And there's one prophetic line there in that, which I think, you know, it's really a prophetic song, uh, but there's one prophetic line which applies both to Israel, to the United States, into the changing world we live in. And he says that sort of a warning, he said, you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone because at times they are changing. So that summarizes most of all, you know, how do you deal, uh, how do governments, how do people, how do institutions deal with a changing environment? The times are changing. The question is, how do governments, how do people, how do institutions deal with change? How are they able to adopt to change, absorb change? And my view of it, in, in a met metaphorical sense, is you have to develop those skills of extreme sports. I would call it surfing on tsunami waves, actually. In other words, you have to keep yourself above water, or not swimming or surfing. I think that's what Israel has been doing, because... What you actually see is a confluence of two major forces today. One, the, the one, the traditional use of force, which is the hardcore force, that is military, uh, uh, military means, advanced military means, of course, uh, that could be uh, sanctions, okay, 
uh, economic sanctions. And at the same time, a new actor appears on the scene, soft force, what we call in pu public diplomacy, uh, the use of the media, the use of narratives that are being used. And governments and people as well have to deal with both. Uh, sometimes they're very successful in dealing with one or the other, but I think the trick is in, in this new environment is how do you bring the two together to deal with them. And from my experience in the military, I can give you to relate to you one thing. Uh, I finished my mm -hmm. master's in broadcasting journalism uh, at Syracuse University. It took me about a year to finish that. It took me less than two days to forget everything I learned that was June 1982 in Beirut. Because there you saw how soft force, if you want, how the media has been used, misused, and abused by the various actors. And that, and there, that was a learning experience to me. Uh, as time passed, we see that more and more countries are prone and are affected, at countries and government, by the soft force. Take, for example, WikiLeaks. You know, the, uh, the taking of... Uh, secret documents and putting them on the air to the embarrassment of governments and, and other people. And, and this is something that governments and public officials have to reckon with, have to deal with. Uh, I give you another example. When Israel had to deal with the Marmara, that ship that, uh, that, uh, that was bound to break the siege on Gaza and everything, uh, we were very good at dealing with the hardcore force in order to stop it. But I think we failed in dealing with a soft core force. You know, that's what would be the implication of the pictures that would come across. The media war, which is again a very media important war. one. I, God, but, yes. but, but, but I like to use the term, the more neutral term. It's not a media war, but really, how, how do you apply soft force in a very effective way so that you can get your point across or that you can win the battle? And we found out that in Israel, I say with an experience of over 30 years, that unless you have some sort of a balance between the hardcore force and the soft force, you're bound to lose something. And, uh, and definitely, I said the Marmara is a case where we lost because we didn't apply soft force. Whereas the last operation that Israel conducted, pillar of defense in Gaza, there was a good balance between soft and hardcore force. And as a result of that, the results of the operation were much better for Israel. It's interesting when you get the information from a group that has their own, uh, their own agenda as well. And you have to understand what they're selecting to broadcast. And what, you, what we end up getting is a conflict, for example, in this country between Channel 7 and Channel 4 and 10. Right. Uh, so I watch the, the seven o'clock, the ten o'clock news on seven, and then I go to the eleven o'clock news on six. So I get both points of view, even though they're talking about the same event, but they talk about it in different styles, right. different ways. So we have that. To, that also becomes part of the the, the quality of of the inter interactions, which we absorb and process. And if you're not skilled, you believe this, and then you believe that, and then you don't know what to believe. So when I, my interest in, in having you here is to see, to get your insights into Israel's position in an environment where they've already negotiated quite a bit and have given away quite a bit, but it makes no difference. The strategy that the other side seems to be using to me is we'll get a little bit each time, but Israel is only a little bit anyway. So each time, Israel is constantly fighting this other new battle that you talk about between the soft and the hard. And they, I'm asking myself the question, how much longer could they play this game without eventually doing what they did, which was making an of an invasion using the hard. I absolutely agree with you, but I will complicate the picture a little more. Because in addition to Channel 4 and 7, we have this new media, the social networks, yes. Twitter, uh, Facebook, and that we've seen their effect in the Arab Spring, for example. 
that's a whole new ball game in the software arena. <laughs> and uh, so you have to take that into consideration in addition to regular television. In other words, when I, when I graduated from, uh, from uh, Syracuse University and, and I started practicing, you know, uh, television, using television, there was only television, you know, the U.S. channel. Right. Then there were the Arab channels. And then... You know, you had the, the social networks, and then, which is a whole new ballgame. More people are participating in that, and you have to take that into consideration. In, what, in one respect, it exacerbates the problem that Israel has, but on the other, it offers new opportunities. Because if you can get into that new uh, uh, social networks and really reach the young and the restless, I call them, those who are using it, then you can have, it's a major political force. It's a force to be reckoned with. It's a force that can change, actually, the environment. So uh, I, the, the picture is not all bleak. But, uh, but definitely, I would say, I gave you an example of the Barmara, which was, I would say, not such a good example of a good use of the uh, hardcore force and the, uh, the soft force, or I'd say uh, we we took out of the toolbox that we had mostly the hardcore, but we didn't use the other because we're also good at the other. But in, in, in the operational sense, you have to combine the two together. And then we have an example where it did work in the recent operation, uh, Pillar of Defense, that was done uh, this year, uh, last year actually, 2012. Uh, there was a good preparation in terms of using soft force or soft power. Uh, you approach the other state and you explained what? You show pictures of the damage caused by the missiles, all in advance of the operation. And when the operation took place, you uh, used certain weapon system and you used certain technology to minimize collateral damage, knowing very well that there's a certain threshold. If you don't cross that threshold, you're going to do very quite well with the media. You're going to do quite well with your allies and definitely with your enemies because they can't use uh, like the buzzword massacre, massacre, because there wasn't a massacre. This reminds me, uh, Colonel Gissing, of how in the 2006 war, when Israel finally retaliated after so many thousands of missiles were rained down on Israel and Israel finally tiptoed in and retaliated, some countries and media around the world had the chutzpah to say Israel's response was disproportionate. How interesting it is in the world of propaganda and uh, misinformation to use the power of a word disproportionate in order to paint Israel as the, the bully and the Arabs as the, as the victims. That was preposterous. What are your thoughts on how Israel is singled out for well, criticism? Well, first of all, to educate uh, our public and to educate our viewers, uh, it's not just using that word uh, for political uh, purposes or for prop propaganda purposes. Because the essence of Article 51, which is the article of the UN Charter, which talks about self-defense, actually says you have the right to use force, but the caveat is it can't be, you know, dis mispro disproportional to the target. So one way to say that Israel is misusing or abusing this right is to say it's using disproportional force, okay? Now, what is disproportional? I can tell you, for one, from statistically speaking, since uh, operation, uh, the operation in Lebanon and cast lead and the operation in, in Israel is the leading country in the world in minimizing collateral damage compared to combatants. In other words, the ratio between combatants and that in Israel, no other military in history has achieved that kind of ratio. Not in Afghanistan, not in Vietnam, not in any of the recent asymmetrical wars that were fought there. But then again, as you pointed out, uh, Richard, it's a propaganda war. And of course, if you can just show that this is disproportional by selecting certain pictures and certain narratives, then of course, Israel then still has a problem, as I said, you know, because it's been, after, after you, you raise the issue of using disproportional force, you can take it to The Hague to the International Criminal Court and so forth. So it's not just propaganda. This is a means by which you are trying to corner Israel or to put it in a position where it does not have a right to use force. Why? It uses it disproportional. And what were the results of using it disproportional? If when you use disproportional force, you can be accused of committing a crime. <laughs>
This is very interesting, but I'd like to ask you, Abe, from an educational point of view, what are the challenges in the United States and worldwide in bringing a higher level of rationality to the masses? How do we do this? I don't think you do it by bringing it to them. You, it comes up as a process of information exchange. It comes as doing what we're doing right now, talking to one another and talking about soft and hard. Uh, it's a different way of expressing using military forces against other kinds of forces that where you don't use guns and to shoot one another, but words do shoot one another. Uh, it's a substitution. But it's going on all the time. On one hand, we're talking about education and we're talking about multimedia, but I don't see in the Middle East, Colonel Gissing, how multimedia and uh, the Facebook and, and other uh, mo uh, social media have had an influence that have made things any better. The uh, Arab Spring has become kind of an Arab winter. What are your thoughts on how well, technology has not improved things well, there? Well, definitely the mixture of hardcore and soft core uh, force in the Middle East is a very explosive <laughs> combination. I'd say it's not just a, because definitely there's been use of force there, uh, uh, unmitigated use of force, massacres, killing of innocent civilians. And at the same time, all the actors are trying to use the soft force and the media and the social networks to their advantage. What happened in the Middle East really, and that comes with the injection of the social networks uh, into the equation of uh, uh, internal strife, of fratricide, of uh, uh, the fight between uh, countries, and that's definitely what happened in the Arab Spring, is that a new force arrives on the scene. Actually, the governments which conducted their affairs in the Middle East, I'm not talking about Israel, because Israel is a democracy and that's very different, but they were able to continue to govern uh, and to maintain legitimacy by fear. In other words, there was always the fear of the masses, the fear of those in the, in the square, in Tahrir Square, from the palace. Why? Because the palace, uh, the Arab rulers, always have the means of coercive, coercive means in order to suppress any opposition. Or to Facebook and the social networks, the new technology created something new. Not so much because, you know, the, this was something that came out on the air and, 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 and the people were saying things. I mean, the freedom of information that it created, or the degrees, of, that's one aspect. But it created a sociological phenomenon, unprecedented in human history and in the history of revolutions. It created cyber solidarity, I call it. Usually, when you wanted to have a revolution, you needed organic solidarity. People coming together, joining in the, in the streets, establishing a party, starting to march. Here, you have people who never met, who communicate with each other on this, uh, I would say, this social network, you know, through their computers, in a language that I and my generation cannot understand, but they do. And they see that they have something in common, even though they never met. And therefore, at a given moment in time, 200,000, 300,000 appear in Cairo, in Tahrir Square, to the great surprise of the government. That's one thing. The second thing that happens is that they're not afraid any longer. And then you, when you try to understand, I think this is a subject for a dissertation. I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to offer some of my, my uh, uh, per perceptions about what happened there. Why are they not afraid? Because fear was the dominant factor that enabled the regime to suppress. They're not afraid because they are counted. Well, speaking of spreading fear and information, Abe, in academia, we hear about universities having students exposed to propaganda and misinformation and uh, all sorts of events in that area which seem to be totally foreign uh, to what should be a rational process of evaluating fact and study and so forth. What are your thoughts on the misinformation and the lobbying that occurs in academia? It's only misinformation if you know that it's not true. It may not be misinformation for those who are sending it. It's the information they got, they process and they send it. And they believe it. They believe that narrow picture, that that's what they're sending. 
So for those who are sending, it's not misinformation. They don't have information in its broadest sense. They have a narrow form of, of picking out what's in processing and what they believe is the truth, and that's what they send. Newspapers don't really send misinformation on purpose because that, that's the belief structure they operate through. Well, I think they do lie by omission, by emphasizing some points and then omitting others. They may if they deliberately do that, but in some cases they don't deliberately do that. That's the information they, they got and that's what they're sending. They can only send what, they, what people right. tell them or what they see. And but you know, one of the things that happens over time, over time, I mean that's also a strategic change, is the extent to which you can lie to people has become highly limited in terms of time because there's always this information that is coming from all directions which people can access very easily so you know like when they're saying you know at the arab spring israel is the devil or the conspiracy everything that has happened here is the result of the israeli and the zionist conspiracy the young and the restless they say well you know okay okay but prove it to us one two Okay, maybe that's the case, but what have you done recently for us? You always talk to us, you can't do anything because the Zionist conspiracy, but what have you done to us? In other words, they don't buy it any longer. They don't buy the propaganda on the face of it, and the, the, the extent to which you can uh, actually brainwash people or, or, or tell them, you know, this is what you have to believe in, is limited because they have other sources of information, other points of access to gain information from themselves without the intervention of the government. And speaking of information, a significant percentage of people in the United States don't even know where Washington DC is. So I regard ignorance as a very threatening fact in our world today. Education in a democracy is very, very important because your vote and my vote count. And so if you think that this country is edu miseducating people or not educating them to function in a democracy in a complexity of our world, we're not gonna make it. We're not gonna make it. So education becomes even more important, more important. And you can't afford to have 30% of the ninth graders not graduating. At the risk of uh repeating what uh, President Obama has been saying in his speeches, there's no doubt that the ability of the United States of America to reinvent itself lies with education. On that happy note, I'd like to thank you very much for thank being you. with us again, Colonel. Thank you, Abe, a pleasure. My it's pleasure. A pleasure meeting you. Yes, sure. that's been, that's right. I'm looking forward to being you in your country. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be right back. This concludes our special show for today. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.